so good to be with you guys. If I haven't met you, my name is Taylor. I'm the lead pastor here at New Song. And you know, if you're here this morning, right off the bat, and you're not a Jesus follower, stoked that you're here. Normally, I try really hard to speak to you. Today's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, I've got a message really for those of us who identify as Jesus followers specifically today. So if that's you, this is gonna be an awesome opportunity for you to kind of look into the life of a, a Christian, really what it kind of looks like. So today, what we're gonna do, guys, we're continuing our study in the book of Acts. And uh, if you got a Bible, go ahead and open with me to Acts chapter one. We're gonna try to get through one verse, verse 14. We'll get there in just a couple moments. What I wanna talk to you today, wow, that's a cool back screen now. I don't know what's going on, but like I have big old man letters that I can see. This is sweet. Whoever did that is amazing. Thank you. Uh, anyways, so what we're gonna talk about today, everybody, is the role that prayer actually played in the first century church. And, and in fact, not just the first century church in the sense of this was a book of Acts thing, but really the role that prayer has played all throughout church history. And so that's what we're gonna talk about. And, and it, let's just have a moment of honesty. A lot of times, unfortunately so, trying to motivate Christians to pray is like trying to motivate my three-year-old to eat his vegetables, all right? It sucks, it's kind of sad, but it's true. And, and if this is something that already makes you wanna go to sleep on me, knowing that this is what we're gonna talk about today, I wanna say a couple things to you. Number one, if prayer is something that's difficult for you or if it's, if it's really boring, worse than that even, uh, you're doing it wrong. Jesus has something so much more for us. Number two, um, if uh, the greatest, here's what I really believe, the greatest strategy of hell in your life is to keep you from praying. I really believe that, which I think, I think speaks to why it's so hard and could be so boring and difficult, right? Because I really believe that the greatest strategy of hell is to keep you, and in fact, keeping the church as a whole from praying, from being a people that are devoted to prayer because he sees the power of it. And it's been modeled all throughout church history, all throughout church history, when even just a few people, guys, I'm gonna tell you some crazy stories today, right? Even just a few people will get serious about praying and seeking God and just, we are going after this. We're gonna be devoted to prayer. Heaven has responded. The spirit of God has been poured out. Tens and thousands, and if not even millions of people have been saved in a very short period of time. The sick are healed, dead are raised, literally, physically. I mean, it's crazy what God has done throughout history as the people of Jesus have sought God and just prayed, become a people devoted to prayer. It's led to the, to the transformation of city and really society. And we're gonna talk about a lot of that today. Heaven invades the earth when the church prays. That's the reality that we're working with today. And so Acts chapter one, verse 14, look at this verse, says this, all of these, meaning Jesus's followers, with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brother. So uh, if you're brand new here, you haven't been here the last few weeks, we're studying the book of Acts for a little bit here context of Acts chapter one, Jesus, he lives, he dies, he raises from death, he ascends to heaven where he is installed as the king of the ages. And the first thing that the ascended Jesus has his disciples do, this is so important, you have to see this. Notice what he doesn't have them do. He doesn't have, we know Jesus takes the throne up in heaven and he doesn't say, okay, Peter, go start preaching. He doesn't say, go plant a bunch of churches or open up a lemonade stand on the side of the road and, you know, like take some tithes and offerings. Like he doesn't do that. What Jesus has his people do, first and foremost, we have to get this, is what? Pray. He sets them to praying. In fact, in Acts, what we're gonna notice is when, there's, when we see a lot of Holy Spirit activity, in context, there's gonna be constantly a lot of prayer that's happening. And the reverse, the reverse of that statement can be true. Where there's a lot of prayer happening in the book of Acts, there is a lot of Holy Spirit activity. That's, just, that's the reality of what happens. This is a model. Uh, where there's prayer, God moves. And in fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 21, he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Listen, I mean, th think about that, okay? Like, think about how we define church, right? And here's Jesus Christ himself, the head of the church, the author of the church, the creator of the church, and he's literally defining what we're gonna be all about. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. In other words, notice what Jesus doesn't say, right? He doesn't say my house is gonna be called a house of preaching or a house of programs or a house of whatever else we like to make church all about. Uh, you know, like he says, my house is gonna be called a house of prayer, not a place that you go to for an hour a week, hear a talking head for a little bit and sing some songs and then go on with your life. 
He says, it's gonna be called a house where I, d- I dwell, the, the house of prayer. I mean, think about that, man. That's what's available to us. Like Jesus' house, the place where he dwells with his presence, with his power, with his person. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Jesus is saying, listen, man, I don't want you to just play church. I want you to actually be the church by becoming a house of prayer. In fact, Leonard Ravenhill, who is a a pastor, theologian, amazing, crazy guy of the last hundred years, he says this, this is so good. The church stops playing when she starts praying. Meaning what, right? We can either play church or we can actually be the church. Let's talk about what playing church for a second looks like, right? Because playing church, here's what playing church looks like, is we've got a really nice polished Sunday service, good music, at least decent coffee. Uh, You know, we're in a good financial situation. We're pretty comfortable. The preaching is never really offensive. It never really comes to bear on my life or, or, you know, the Bible never really confronts me and tells me to live differently. It's just pretty comfortable. We're just kind of looking for a cruise ship environment where we can sit by the pool all day in the sun and sip on cocktails and complain about why the food sucks. That right there, that's playing church. And we're present as consumers and complainers instead of contributors. We're not really living missionally or with any kind of concern for the city. Meanwhile, the byproduct of that is we're just, we're dead. We're dead. That's what happens. When we play church, we just become spiritually dead. There's no power. People aren't giving their life lives to Jesus, excuse me, they're not really getting saved, there's no impact on culture, what are we doing? We're playing, and we stop playing when we start praying, says Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, And notice the first part of verse 14 right here in Acts chapter one, what does it say? All these with one accord, one accord, right? They were one in heart and mind, 120 people, think about this, in this cramped out, sweaty upper room, uh, and they were in one heart and one mind, devoted to prayer, right? This was like, this was what was of first importance to them. This wasn't just like a side hustle thing that the church was doing. This was like, we are giving all of our energy and all of our attention to this. And in fact, the entire book of Acts is going to flow out of this prayer meeting. I hope you're listening, guys. This is legit, okay? Literally, the entire book of Acts is about to flow out of this prayer meeting. The Holy Spirit is about to be poured out in Acts chapter two. 3,000 people are gonna be born again into in a matter of hours. Sick people are gonna be healed. There's gonna be dreams and visions and signs and wonders and a cultural transformation and cities coming to know Jesus. And you can bring it all right back to a prayer meeting, bro. That is absolutely, this is where the whole thing gets kicked off right now. Here, it all starts with the prayer meeting. And I'm telling you, man, what we need most in our nation right now is not to get through COVID era, although that's gonna be a great, beautiful day. It's not a new president, not new governing leaders. What we need in the church most isn't new strategy on how to be more relevant to the world around us and win more people to Jesus. There's a place for strategy. But what we need most in the church and in the nation right now and in the nations of the earth is for the church of Jesus to become what he always intended it to be. A house of prayer. That is the most critical, important need of this hour. And in fact, E.M. Bounds, he says this, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use. Do we have any men in this room that the Holy Spirit can use? He goes on and he says, men of prayer, Not just men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. I love that. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men and men of prayer. What's he saying? He's saying, you wanna see God move? Pray. This is what it looks like. Jim Cimbala, who's a pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle, he says, uh, I think it's, anyways, they have the Brooklyn Tabernacle. I don't know if that's what their church is called. Anyways, so he says this. Prayer, that was relevant for two people in the room. Don't troll me. All right. He says, prayer begets revival. Prayer begets revival. What does that mean? Praying leads to revival. Let's talk about revival for a second, because what is that? That's kind of a weird, esoteric, kind of charismatic word. Maybe you've never heard it before. Maybe you, your skin is crawling because you just heard me say that because of your church uh, background. Let me, let me talk to you about this for a second. Let's get some definition of turns here. Jesus in Revelation chapter three, what he's doing right off the bat in the book of Revelation is he's speaking to seven different churches, and most of them he comes with the word of correction. And we specifically get to the church of Laodicea, which is the last church that Jesus addresses. And look with me, starting in verse 15, we're going to go through 19. Listen to what Jesus says here. 
I know your works. Keep in mind, he's talking to a church. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Just let that land on your heart for a second, okay? I actually got saved with that verse right there. So love it. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel, that's so intense. This is Jesus, right? Little lamb, nice, cuddly, comfortable Jesus. You're a wretched sinner. Congratulations. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Right, what's, what's Jesus saying? He's like, listen, you, I, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but you're in this lukewarm state that's in the middle. And because of that, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth, right? Like he's, he's saying, you, you, you think that you've prospered and that you don't have any need of anything. What's he saying? Is you've become self-reliant. You're in a good financial situation. You're generally living pretty comfortably. There's no real deep hunger, desperation, passion, or love for Jesus. You might even go to church every once in a while. You maybe even tithe. And, and Jesus is like, there's no real passion passion in your heart for me. There's no real fire, spiritual fire or urgency. You're lukewarm. And so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, right? We're walking around. We're saying I'm good, right? Like I don't really need God in my life. I'm pretty comfortable, you know, like even going through COVID era. It's like, you know, not a lot of people in this room, you didn't get laid off. And some of you, your businesses did better this last year than they ever have before. And, and what happens is we can be tricked into living a lukewarm life that disconnects from passion for God because we get tricked into this position of saying, I don't actually need him in my life. I don't need Jesus. I'm doing pretty good on my own. And here's the thing, here's the point. Jesus shows up to those people and he's like, no, listen, you are wretched you are pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. It's a false, you know, assurance that you have about your current state. You're lukewarm. He's looking at the condition of your soul, of your heart, and he's saying you're lukewarm, right? And here's the, here's the thing. You don't have to be a church expert commentator to recognize that we in the Western world of the 21st century, we are the church of Laodicea. That's, that's us. Jesus literally, he just read your mail. He just read our mail as the church of the 21st century. Ian Paisley, he says this, the church of Jesus Christ is largely sleeping like a great bedroom and you have all the Christians in bed and they're all sleeping and they're saying, please don't wake me up. I want to sleep on. And of course, when God starts to operate a revival, people cannot sleep. Whew. You cannot sleep in a church when the spirit of God awakens the people. He's talking about Isaiah 52, verse one right here. He's quoting from, he says, awake, awake, put on strength. Wake up, you sleepy Christians. Awake thou that sleepeth, arise from the dead. Christ will give you life. What's he saying? He's saying, we're asleep, man. We're, we're lukewarm. We have gone to sleep. Jesus, uh, there's this amazing moment in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. I love this, where basically somebody comes up to Jesus and he's like, hey, tell me, what's the most important thing in the Bible, right? Like, anybody got that kind of mind? Like, I just love that. Like, this, is, this thing is so big. There's so much there. And he just comes up to Jesus. and He's like, what's the most important thing? And Jesus responds to this guy and he says this, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God. Love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Jesus is literally bringing everything down to a focal point. He's like, okay, you wanna know what the most important thing is? Let me tell you what the whole book is about. All right, right here. Love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so what I, what I, can, can I convict you for a second? Is that okay? Can I bring some conviction in church for a second, ladies and gentlemen? I'm gonna do it anyways. You're stuck here, so... And you can't get up and walk out because that would be rude and we're nice people. Let me, let me convict you for a second. Does that describe your life? Think about that. Literally, 
I, I, okay, so here's the thing about being a preacher. You got, that feels intense right now. I've been sitting here. I've had to sit here all week long, okay? I'm just like taking inventory of my entire life, everybody that I hang out with. Is this how you describe your life? Like, can you honestly say by how you lived your life this last week, yes, I am somebody who loves Jesus with all of my heart, with all of my mind, my soul, my strength. That is the description of my life. Let me, let me even turn the lens on you a little bit. Is that how the people closest to you would define what your life is all about? Your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, the people that you associate with, people in your neighborhood, your friends, right? Is this how people that you are close with in your life would describe your life, right? Or, 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 or would they see something like, man, you know, like he seems to be kind of all about money, about the money game. Let's just like live in a comfortable life, more vacation time, uh, you know, like he seems to work a lot. He's a nice enough guy, you know, like never had a bad interaction with him. He kind of always seems to smile, but oh my gosh, I didn't even know he was a Christian. Does that, does what Jesus is saying here describe your life? Why? What's the point? He's saying this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. And this is what Jesus is getting at in Revelation chapter three. And here's, here's the thing, man. I'm, I'm not saying if that's you, because I think in some extent we all fit into that category. What I'm not saying is you need to beat yourself up and try harder to love God, right? Like you, man, just feel bad about that because that's not how this works at all. First John chapter four, verse 10. Look at this. This is good news for you. This is you. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. It's, it, 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 Jesus is saying, listen, come back to my love that I have for you. Like if you don't have love for Jesus in your heart right now, if, if what Jesus is saying in Matthew isn't really defining your life, let me tell you exactly why. Because you are not living underneath the downpour of his affection for you. You're not living in 1 John 4 verse 10. That's exactly what's going on. Revival, guys, is what happens when the spirit of God and Lord do it in my day, do it with us. Revival is when the spirit of Jesus rushes in on the church and ignites first and foremost a great, unquenchable, undeniable, uncompromising, unrelenting passion and love for Jesus. That's where revival starts. Lukewarmness then, right? The antithesis of revival. <clears throat> it happens. You wanna know why it happens? It happens because of prayerlessness. Lukewarmness in your life happens because of prayerlessness. Prayer, prayer literally is the anecdote to lukewarmness in your life. Why? Think about it. You come in contact with God right? You come, prayer is about living in proximity with Jesus, man, whom Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says in, is an all-consuming fire. The apostle John in the book of Revelation in the first chapter, he has an encounter with the resurrected and glorified Jesus Christ. He falls at his feet as though dead. And the only reason he can lift his face off of the ground is because Jesus touches him and gives him strength to do that. And John looks in the eyes of Jesus and he says they were like it was like burning flames of fire looking into his eyes. Ezekiel, in the first chapter of Ezekiel, he has this encounter with Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, which is crazy. And he, said, he describes him as a flame of fire from the waist up and a flame of fire from the waist down. What am I trying to say, man? When you live a life of prayer, you are coming in close proximity to God who is on all-consuming fire and your soul catches fire. Like you do not come out of that unchanged. Prayer is about living in close proximity to Jesus. And so if lukewarmness happens, man, it's because of prayerlessness. Now, let me, let me up the ante on that one more time and say this. Prayerlessness, what it is, is it's evidence of lovelessness in your life. I'm just, I might just be making up words here right now. I don't know, but you know what I'm trying to say. Prayerlessness is evidence of lovelessness for Jesus. Uh, you know, I mean, think about it, right? Like, like let me just illustrate it this way. When you love somebody, you're crazy. You literally become the most obnoxious person on the face of the planet. Like you become obsessed with this person when you meet somebody and you fall in love with them, right? Like that was Marissa and I. It was the worst thing I've ever experienced, right? Like I'm not normally a mushy person, guys, but literally uh, now when we started dating, I'm hanging out in her kitchen. I'm quoting her Romeo and Juliet while we're sipping on wine and making fettuccine, okay? Absolutely pathetic, but you want to, you're obsessed with this person, man. You're like, I'll do anything 
just to be with you. I want to spend all of my time with you, right? And, and so what happened is we got, we got married and that all changed pretty quick. Our first year of marriage was a disaster. I actually, fun story. I remember this one fight we had really quick soon after we got married and uh, I'm, I'm in the bedroom. She's out in the kitchen. We just kind of start, you know, going back and forth and she's throwing stuff my way and I'm just shooting it down, pew, 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 you know, right back in her direction, shutting it down, not giving her an inch of grace. You got to feel bad for her, Right? Like I'm a preacher. She's married to a preacher. My spiritual gift is like arguing if there is such a thing, all right? So I've got literally home court advantage every time we have any kind of confrontation. And so, you know, I'm shooting back at her. She's shooting at me. And then all of a sudden I say something. It was a zinger. I was such a jerk. I don't know what it was. 10 seconds of quiet. And I'm like, I got her now. And all of a sudden I hear this giant explosion in our kitchen. And I'm like, what was that? And so I book it out there, right? I'm like, what is going on? She's on the ground and she had smashed a plate on the ground in our apartment. Okay, you guys, when you see Marissa, you see perfect little sweet Marissa. Here she is literally throwing down in our apartment, guys. And so I'm freaking out. I'm like, are you joking me? What did you just do? You need to get out of here and go cool off like you're crazy, right? I'm like, like, I'm actually trying to kick her out. This is all my fault, by the way, okay? I'm trying to kick her out. She doesn't go. And so what do I do? I storm out, slam the door, and I go and like cool off for 30 minutes, okay? That was, that, was, we, we, that only happened one time, by the way. I guess I should say that. We figured out pretty quick that was not how we were gonna make it uh, in our marriage. And, uh, you know, we figured some stuff out. I love my wife. She is my best friend. I love her so much. I can't imagine my life without her. Thankfully, we're back in that crazy, you know, newly married stage where all we want to do is spend time together. Why? Because I love her so much. I want to be with her. That's what prayer is all about, man. Prayerlessness in your life is evidence of lovelessness for Jesus. And here's the amazing thing. You know, Jesus wants to be with you. It's like, dude, that's the invitation of discipleship, guys. When Jesus says, come follow me, he says, come and be with me. Come and sit with me. Let's be together. That is the desire of God for your life. And Jesus in Revelation chapter three, when he's speaking to the Laodicean church, he's saying, listen, I have true, rich, I have true riches for you. I have true riches you actually, whether you realize it or not, you want to be with me. I am the source of every longing and desire and fulfillment in your soul. I am who you are truly looking for. Come buy from me gold refined in fire. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, this is really interesting. I found this this last week, a couple days ago, when I was hanging out with Jesus. He brought me to this verse in Isaiah 55, verse 1. Look at this, because I think Jesus wants us to have this verse in mind when we're reading that passage in Revelation 3. He says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That sounds stupid, right? Like, how are you gonna buy if you don't have money? That doesn't work. That's not a thing. That's called theft, all right? And Jesus is saying, come and buy without price, What's going on? How can you buy without money? Let me tell you exactly why. Because Jesus paid what it cost you. That's the cross. It's his blood poured out on your behalf for you because of you instead of you, satisfying the wrath of God, taking your sin so he could have you, bless you, hold you, love you, treasure you for eternity starting right now. That's how you can buy without price because Jesus paid everything. So expensive, man, his love for you, it cost him blood. And that's why here at New Song, you know, we say this every once in a while and it's so true. We don't want Jesus to just be savior and Lord of your life. He has to be, right? Jesus is the only way that you are saved, the only way that you can have eternal life, come in relationship with God, have your sins forgiven. He is the only savior and he won't be savior if he's not in fact Lord of your life, meaning he's final authority, he's king, he's God of your life and you surrender to him in that light, in that right? But we want him to also be your treasure, like, do you, do you treasure Jesus? Does your, does, you, do you, do your, does your heart like burn because you just love him so much? In light of what he's done for you, like, is he your true 
treasure. Because here's the point, man. As a Jesus follower, what you gotta understand, that's the only thing that's gonna sustain you. So that's it. That's the only thing that's gonna sustain you is if you learn to really treasure Jesus. And it's only ever gonna happen, I'm telling you, if you become a person of prayer. So that's, that's the only way because you're becoming a person who is constantly coming in contact with Jesus. One more thing before we uh, pivot into something different here. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about this. You know, prayer is not something for the more spiritual Christians, right? It, it's, 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 not like, it's not like the supersize me option, all right? Like, like it's not like, you know, you, you guys remember the supersize days? You know, you go to McDonald's, I'll take a Big Mac, give me number one. And they're like, do you want to supersize it? And you're like, sure, I don't need my arteries to function correctly. That's fine, you know? But like, like, being devoted to prayer is not the super size me version of Christianity. Like you don't have kind of the entry level Big Mac meal, regular size Christians that don't show up to the prayer meeting, that don't have a prayer life, that don't live in communion and intimacy with God. And then you have the super size me Christians that are like walking around like, man, I, I eat demons for breakfast, right? Like that's not, <laughs> these things just come to me sometimes, everybody, <laughs> right? Like that's not, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. Like Jesus is like, this is normal Christianity. And it's the only way that it actually works. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, pray without ceasing. Gosh, without ceasing. Like he's, what, what's Paul saying? He's saying, I want you to live a life that's just constantly coming in contact with God. You know, you're, 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 uh, you're on the job and you've got one foot there and you've got one foot in the heavens. You're listening to the Holy Spirit. You're communing with the Holy Spirit. You're driving your car. You're paying attention to the road for the love of God. And you're praying. You're engaging with the Spirit. Uh, you're at home with screaming crazy wild kids. You're there, but you also have your ear inclined to the Holy Spirit. You're praying. You're communing with God. With God. It's about learning intimacy with Jesus in all of life. This is what he paid for, man. This is the invitation of Christianity. And it's so devastating because what happens is so many of us settle for, I go to church every once in a while. And Jesus is like, this is eternal life, that you know me. It's on offer for every single person in this room. And what happens all throughout church history is when the church gets serious about prayer, God moves, right? Acts chapter one, verse 14, they're devoted to prayer. 3,000 people about to be born again. The Holy Spirit's about to be poured out. All of that, right? When the church prays, heaven moves. This wasn't just something that happened in the book of Acts, but the last 2,000 years of church history, this continues to be the model where when the people of God seek his face, cry out for the church in the city, heaven invades the earth. Let me, I'm actually gonna give you a, a little church history uh, here, guys, because this is awesome. I wanna give you some examples from the last several hundred years of exactly that happening. And what I'm hoping is that this is gonna build your faith and it's gonna build our faith as a church to believe God for the same exact thing to happen at New Song and happen in Bellingham. Uh, and in fact, Dr. A.T. Pearson, he says this, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Very true. Jason Hubbard, he says, revival is, I don't think this is in the notes. Jason Hubbard says, the revival is the holy manifestation of God's presence descending on the church. Revival from heaven impacts both the church and society. It is accompanied by extraordinary conviction for sin, fear of God and his judgment, revelation of God's love and mercy, confession and repentance of sin, and people inquiring on the day of Pentecost, what must I do to be saved? So let me give you some examples, all right? So we're gonna back all the way up to 1727, all right? There's a little town in Germany called Hernhut, and there was this guy, somebody's excited, all right, cool, talking to you guys over here. Um, there was a little town called Hernhut with uh, 220 people in it. And there was a count, his name was Count Zinzendorf. And basically what happened is these guys, they were just praying, they were going after Jesus. And all of a sudden they experienced what they referred to as their personal Pentecost. They had an Acts chapter two moment. The Holy Spirit filled them. And what happened is 48 people, they committed to taking an hour of day in prayer and they launched a prayer meeting that literally lasts without stopping for 100 years. 48 people 
And what, what, what was their conviction, right? It's like, okay, so they, they saw in Revelation 4 that God is on the throne and he's always being worshiped and praised and adored. And there's that song, holy, 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 that's been sung from all eternity past and to all eternity in the future. It's a never ending song. And their conviction was, man, Jesus is worthy of that on the earth. Like, like he's called us to be a house of prayer. So let's just do this thing. And they went buck wild, man. I mean, literally a hundred year prayer meeting. That's crazy. And what the, the ridiculous part about this move of the spirit is that they ended up becoming one of, if not the most effective and influential missionary sending movements in church history. They ended up sending uh, Moravians. They were, they were called Moravians to every single continent on the face of the planet. In fact, some of them, because they had so much love for Jesus, because they were a people devoted to prayer, what happened is some of them, they ended up selling themselves into slavery just so that they could get the gospel to people who would ne otherwise never hear the name of Jesus. That's, that's some devotion to God. Like that is some love for Jesus. And where did it all start? In a prayer meeting. Fast forward to the American Revolution. What happened is the, the United States was an incredible place of moral decline, very similar to where we are right now. And in fact, guys, the moment that we're in as a nation, it's nothing to despair of. These are the kind of moments all throughout history that God steps down and moves we're living in that moment right now. And so this was happening in the American Revolution. People were uninterested in God, increasingly so. The church wasn't growing, it was shrinking. How did it change? It was a prayer meeting. In fact, there was a New England pastor, his name was Isaac Bacchus in 1794. When conditions were at their worst, he basically, what he did is he was like, dude, we need, we, our only answer is God. Like there, there is no other answer for the United States of America, for the state of the church, we have to pray. So he ended up sending out this urgent plea to different pastors and denominational leaders. And he was like, guys, we have to seek the Lord for revival in our nation. That he was asking them to, to join him in prayer. And what happened is a lot of people did. And so that all over our country, there was this network of interlaced prayer crying out to God for revival. What were they doing? They were doing Acts 114. They actually took the Bible and was like, okay, this is what happened then. Let's take that and let's actually do it and expect similar results. So they did it and it wasn't long before God sent revival. In the summer of 1800, uh, revival hit Kentucky and all of a sudden like 11,000 people were showing up for a communion service. Can you imagine a communion service with 11,000 people? That's ridiculous. Uh, Charles Finney, he became one of the great spokesmen of the Second Great Awakening, which this time period was referred to. And his ministry really ended up taking off. He was a lawyer and there was a pastor by the name of Daniel Nash. And Charles Finney's ministry really took off when Daniel Nash was called by God to basically leave the pulpit. And Jesus spoke to him and he said, listen, I want you to pray for Charles Finney. And so how these guys' working relationship happened is they would get a sense from the Holy Spirit on where God wanted to move. Daniel Nash went ahead of Finney. He would knock on a door and find a cold, dark, damp, nasty cellar to pray and seek the face of God, sometimes with one or two other people, he would walk into that room and lay prostrate on his face, sometimes for two or three days at a time, fasting and crying out to God for the souls of the city. And once they sensed that they got the breakthrough, he would call Charles Finney in. Finney would come in and preach and thousands of people would get their, give their lives to Jesus, right? Tens of thousands, and in fact, 100,000 people in Rochester, New York, ended up giving their lives to Jesus alone through their ministry. It was a landslide of the Holy Spirit answering the prayer of Daniel Nash and his ministry partners in the place of prayer. Everything changed in the city. Crime dropped, bars shut down, crazy impact. The, the most insane part about this whole thing is uh, what happened was eventually Daniel Nash died and Charles Finney, he tried to keep having these crusades. So he would you know, say, we're gonna meet at this place, come and bring everybody. And he'd preach and the power dried up, they said. Didn't see the amount of people get saved. God wasn't moving as powerfully. So he had to end up going back to his pastorate. Why? Because nobody could handle the weight of intercession like Daniel Nash. That's the point. Where did it start? In a prayer meeting. Fast forward again to the mid 1800s. In the United States conditions were really bad again. A guy by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere, he actually started a prayer meeting in, believe it or not, a Dutch reformed church, okay? Love that, all right? So he starts a prayer meeting in a Dutch reformed church and, um, uh, and what happened is, is Manhattan was a city of about a million people at the time. Only six people showed up to the prayer meeting, which is pretty, that hasn't really changed. Um, so anyways, 
So he starts praying, and then what happens is the next week, about 20 people show up, and then the next week, 50. And then with a few, within a few months, they completely outgrow the church, and they're in several other different buildings and gathering places all throughout the city for an hour of prayer, right? There was one guy, he ended up, uh, people from the city were like, wow, something's going on here. We gotta figure out how many people are actually gathering to pray. So they took some representatives to go actually count how many people were praying, and within the hour, they couldn't get to every location, but they counted that there was, at, there was 6,000 100 people that were gathering to pray in the city. That's ridiculous. There was a ton more. That's all they could count. Could you imagine what a prayer meeting of 6,000 Christians in Whatcom County would do to the spiritual landscape of the world around us? So it makes sense. I mean, God, God ended up pouring out a spirit really fast. There was 10,000 people a week uh, in Manhattan that ended up starting to give their lives to Jesus. In New York, 10,000 people a week started to get born again. And in fact, more than 1 million people ended up getting saved and giving their lives to Jesus in one year. Where did it start? A prayer meeting. They did Acts 1.14. Guys, here's the deal. Here's what I'm saying. We can play church or we can be the church. All throughout history, let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. Billy Graham, actually. Everybody else, you're probably like, who the heck is that guy? Everybody in this room has probably heard of Billy Graham, right? Like the, the pastor of America, uh, as, he's been, as he's been called. The greatest evangelist in church history, by far. Literally, the guy led hundreds of thousands, millions of people to the Lord. So what happened was when Billy Graham was a kid in his home in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, his dad and several other people from the community, they were holding a prayer meeting on, on their property. And what they were doing is they were interceding for God to raise up a voice. <sighs> to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That God would raise up a mighty voice for Jesus in their generation. Billy Graham was a kid hanging out with the cows next door. Fast forward a few years, he ends up giving his life to Jesus around 16, does some Bible school, starts preaching. And uh, what ha he, he ended up, when he first started, it was like nothing was happening. Nobody was getting saved, nothing, just nothing. It was horrible. And he was so frustrated about it. And he ended up going to see this guy preach. His name was Stephen Olford. And, and before Stephen Olford gave the, uh, the, in, the invitation for people to come forward and receive Christ, people were rushing the front. And Billy was like, that's what I want. I want that. So he goes up and he talks to the guy. And he's like, hey man, I want what you have. I don't know what it is, but give it to me because I don't have it. And so Stephen's like, okay, man, here's the deal. We're gonna go to my, we're gonna go to my cabin in the woods. We're gonna spend some time together. They did that, spent a few days in fasting and prayer, studying the scripture. And Stephen was like, dude, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Billy was like, okay, let's pray for it. They pray, they wait on God. And Billy Graham talks about this as in his own experiences, as in his autobiography, he talks about how he was, he just started screaming like maybe not screaming, crying out, I have it, I have it, that's it. And so he got up to preach again. And before he could give the invitation, people rushed the front and that's when his ministry really began to take off. Where did it start, guys? A prayer meeting. Had some people, podunk little Charlotte, North Carolina, daring to believe God for another move of the spirit that would shake the planet. And heaven answered, Literally, I could tell you a hundred different stories like that, right? Like we, we didn't even scratch the surface right there of what God has done in church history. What's the point? I just gotta believe, guys, if Jesus will do it through them, he'll do it through us. Like I, I have to believe that. God is no respecter of persons. If he'll do it through them, why not us? And this is why, man, we are not giving up on this vision to become a house of prayer at New Song Church. Let me just give you some vision here for a second for our church. One of our value statements, uh, it's, it, it's literally, we wanna be a people in pursuit of the presence of God by becoming a house of prayer. Like that's, that's where we're going. We wanna become a house of prayer. In my conviction, we need the presence of Jesus. Like the manifest, we need the presence of God in our midst. And he says in Isaiah 22, verse three, that God inhabits the praises of his people. Like God, we're, we're not gonna be cool enough, guys. We're not gonna be, you know, like smart enough, eloquent enough. No amount of 
Bible degreeing is going to earn us the place where we can begin to work on culture and see transformation. People around us are so jaded by the attractional models of Christianity. Look at our fancy lights come in here and see us and, you know, like have a great, awesome experience created a culture within Christianity of entertainment. We need the presence of God. It's our only hope. And for those of you, let me just speak to the parents in this room right now. For those of you raising kids, I don't want you to operate under this false reality that says that we can just send our kids to Christian school and teach them some Bible verses every once in a while and they're gonna be great. Our only hope for our kids is that they encounter something different that they encounter Jesus. And that's our job, to lead them as parents and as the church into encounters with Jesus. Man, we gotta pray with our kids. I mean, this dude, this this statistic on on Barna is is horrific. 64% of kids today drop out of church by college. 64%. That's devastating. We have to get them to encounter the presence of Jesus. Get them to youth group. Don't let their lives get so cluttered that you neglect their spiritual development. Study the Bible together, pray together, show up to church together. In fact, in, in Barna, in these studies, well, so the, I, I've mentioned this recently, but it's worth noting again, that they've said one of the best things that you can do for your kids uh, as far as like developing resilient faith is actually getting them to church and sitting in the service with them. And then on the way home, you guys talk about the, the, the sermon. So kudos to you parents that are doing that. You're doing one of the most effective things that you can do. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Super pumped for you. That's amazing, right? But like seek God together. We have to teach them how to live in the presence of God. We've got one shot with our kids and we don't wanna waste it. The good news for us though in the midst of all of that, is I think Jesus really means it when he says his house is gonna be called a house of prayer. I think he really means it. Because I've experienced it, right? Like my life has been radically changed in a prayer meeting. In fact, uh, we had, uh, our, our, Marissa and I and Dane and Amy, we have a prayer set here on Thursday nights that we lead together that's just been amazing lately. And uh, I'm gonna invite you to that in a second. Uh, but we, anyways, this last week, we had somebody come in, a lady at our church, amazing, amazing lady. She's actually recently given her heart to Jesus here. And she's just having a really rough day, really hard, really you know, tough week and moment. And so she walked in with a lot of weight on her. And we we're like, hey, you know what? Jesus is a house of prayer. Jesus' house is a house of prayer. We're here. Let's just pray and see what God does. She ends up, and literally, we have so many testimonies of stuff like this happening as a church right now, guys. It's insane. Like, I have not, there is absolutely a rumbling of the Holy Spirit in our midst. I'm gonna share a lot more of these as we go on, but here's one. We start praying for this gal, and she ends up being, like, legit, she gets filled with the Holy Spirit, didn't even really have an understanding of who the Holy Spirit was or what any, anything was. Jesus just decided to move on her. He thinks that he can do that, I guess, you know? Sorry. And so we're praying And all of a sudden, she just feels the weight just begin to fall off of her supernaturally. And she says, it felt like she was being hugged by a family member as the father was just pouring his love into her heart, man. That's crazy, right? Like that was so much more, guys, than just like a, we said a Bible verse and then she had a nice thought about it. Like she is actually legitimately supernaturally encountering the manifest love of the father in her life that's changing her. I think Jesus really means it when he says his house shall be called a house of prayer. Bellingham's a dark place. We need Jesus. Six people committed suicide within 48 hours a couple weeks ago. Several overdoses this week. It's depression, suicide, darkness, economic crisis, crushing weight of the current reality we find ourselves in as a nation present all around us. Our city has rejected Jesus over and over and over and over again. We need a move of God. And I am calling for you to pick up your place, New Song Church, as a priest, to intercede, to cry out, to stand watch, and to be used by Jesus to see this place become a house of prayer. You gotta show up. 
good news is, is Jesus is okay with messy and awkward and I don't know how to pray. He's a really good teacher. So what I wanna do, here's the call to action today, guys, really simple. Thursday night from seven to eight p.m., one hour of your week, come and pray right here. We, our focus is revival in the church, awakening in the city every single week. We're praying for exactly this. And as we've been just going after God, we have seen crazy stuff happens. Thursday night, 7 to 8 p.m. You got kids, don't worry, bring them. It's awesome. I do a majority of the praying from the front so you don't have to feel like you're gonna have to come and get in a group of five different people and you know pray in for 20 minutes straight. You're not gonna have to do that. Uh, we just want you to be able to come and have a place where you can actually experience the presence of Jesus and where we can partner with him to see heaven invade the earth. Uh, and, and we would love to have you as a part of that prayer meeting. If that time doesn't work for you, talk with me. We've got several other prayer meetings that meet during the week, but I'm gonna leave that there for you to consider. Would love to have you come and join us this Thursday, but don't just come once. Like, let's commit to this thing and make this a priority. This is the most important. Listen, there are a few things that you can do, guys, that's gonna have an impact for eternity. You work in your job, building your business, you know, like that doesn't have eternal impact, Right? Everything that we do in this room Thursday nights, every week, eternal impact. And we want you to be a part of that. Why don't you stand with me? Let me, let me pray for us to that end. Jesus, I pray. God, we just, here we, here we stand. We draw the line in the sand today and we say yes and amen to your call to become a house of prayer. And Lord Jesus, we just say, unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. So Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would so anoint us as a church body for this task. God, I pray that we would see prayer times all throughout the week just begin to bubble up here at this church. Lord, I thank you that you are calling us to prayer because you desire intimacy with us. We are created to walk closely with you. And Lord God of heaven and earth, I pray in Jesus' name, as we give you our yes today, that you would do a mighty work as you build us into becoming a house of prayer. Lord, I pray that you bless everybody here. I pray, God, that you, if there's anybody in this room watching online that hasn't given their life to Jesus, that they would not waste another day before surrendering to you, this great God of love who loves them enough to hop up on a cross die for them, raised to life so that they, by faith in him, could have newness of life. God, I pray that they would surrender everything to you today. And God, we just say as New Song Church, make us a house of prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Hey, thank you so much for coming. If we can pray.